Let's get our hymn books and stand. We'll get started here. We'll sing hymn number 13, I Must Tell Jesus. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. 13. <clears throat> I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He is a kind, compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make of my trouble. Quickly and in. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Oh, how the glad we have him to go to. He can just take everything to him. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother David, would you lead us in prayer, please? Father, we uh, thank you for this day, Lord. And, uh, just, uh, thank you for this fine world we're having, Father. It's just such a blessing. Father, we ask you to bless the preacher and I to give us our Amen. Please. Lord, and guide and direct to each and every one of us. Amen. Please be seated, brother. Thank you so much, Brother Gary. Let me turn on my microphone so that if I decide to move away from this platform, I'll still have sound. Message last Sunday morning without the microphone on. I don't know. When they tried to upload it, they didn't nobody tell me the sound wasn't good. So maybe this picked up enough of it to make it work. But anyway, it is good to have you. We are studying out of the Sermon on the Mount and have been doing so now for several weeks and are approaching a milestone. You recall we did not do chapter 5 of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes and, and that of, of that type of thing. That's the character of Christ. We started in Matthew 6, the second chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus begins to give instruction to those who are believers in how they ought to occupy uh, this world, how that we ought to walk uprightly with Him and in fellowship with Him, how we're to behave ourselves, I guess, uh, that we might uh, be seen as a reflection of His character in the world. You remember he said, I am the light of the world. And then he, knowing that he was about to be crucified and called away into heaven, said, now ye are the light of the world. We are like the moon is to the sun, S-U-N. Uh, we reflect his grace, whereby in a very dark place, uh, there's still light. Now you understand the moon was not intended to replace the light. The light is greater than the moon, but I can tell you on a dark, dark night, a full moon is a beautiful sight. 
It doth light up the darkness as though the darkness has run away from the light. Amen. And so we're the, we're the moon, I guess you would say. We're the reflection of Christ. We're not uh, the perfectness of Him, but we are uh, uh, saved and born again, and His Holy Spirit leaves in, lives in us and radiates forth His glory. And so we're about to make a milestone or cross a milestone. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. And while you're turning there, let me go ahead and kind of catch us up with where we've been. Last week we were in missions conference, so we didn't have a class. But we have studied from Matthew 6 and the first uh, 18 verses, which deals with three spiritual actions which the believer uh, 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 portrays or, or that strengthens his walk uh, with the Lord and puts him in good fellowship with Jesus. Uh, as you remember, uh, the, that we were to give our alms. That is, we're to have compassion as Christ had compassion uh, for the indigent, for the poor, and for the out, for those in the world that don't have it as well uh, as we have. Uh, uh, we found that. Amen. Uh, and then uh, we were supposed to uh, uh, pray and keep forth uh, our time with God and set that time aside as spiritual that we might renew our mind daily. He even gave us a model prayer and taught us how uh, that we should pray. Amen. And then we were just supposed to fast. Our fasting was, is simply setting aside or separating ourselves from the world and going aside and dedicating ourselves uh, to a more, a more complete focus on Jesus Christ, not being uh, uh, labored down or, labor, or, or weighted down by the things of the world for a period of time. Uh, that we call fasting. Amen. Uh, uh, and those are the things that the spiritual man does. Walk, uh, the Bible says that we're to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Walking in the spirit is practicing these things in our life. Amen. But then as we came to Matthew 19, all the way down where we're going to be tonight, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, we found that there are also spiritual or things uh, that can destroy that spiritual walk of a believer and leave us walking, as the Bible describes in 1 Corinthians, as carnal believers, having no reflection of God, in, act, in actuality portraying more the world than we do Jesus. Yes, believers that are on their way to heaven can actually do that. Amen. And the Bible told us in Matthew chapter uh, 6 verse, verses 19 all the way down through 7, 1 through 6, that these three things uh, uh, destroy that walk of Christ. And we found in verses 19 through 24 that the first thing was that when we cease to be spiritual minded, seeking the kingdom of God first, then we become materialistically minded. Amen. And we are focused on the things uh, of the world and that draws us away from a dependence upon God of a trust of the Lord for our daily bread. Amen. Uh, and then we also found, uh, I think it was last week or whenever, week before last when we were there, that, is, that we also can walk in self-sufficiency. That's in verse 25 through uh, the end of the chapter in Matthew chapter 6. That self-sufficiency is that I pull myself up by my own bootstrings. I don't need anybody for anything. Everything I've got, I got for myself. Amen. Forgetting that God is the supply in our life. That it is by God's hand that we are or we are not. It's by God's hands that we go and succeed. Remember what James says? Uh, 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 that anything short of depending on God is our own pride pushing God out of the way. And you know what God says about pride. Amen. And with that kind of a very short introduction to catch us up. It brings us to tonight to that third area that destroys the spiritual walk of a believer. And that area is found in chapter 7 verses 1 through 6. Uh, and it has to do with judgment of others. Judge not. Let's stand if you would. And we'll start with those two words, judge not, Matthew chapter 7 verses 1. We'll read all six of the verses. I guarantee you we're not getting through those tonight. But we're going to work on it. I, I mean, we're, we're already halfway home. We finished chapter 6 and chapter, uh, chapter 7 is only 29 verses. How long can that take? <laughs> chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what uh, measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. That sound kind of sounds like you reap what you sow, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. Uh, and why beholdest thou the mote in, that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? What he's saying is look at yourself first. Amen. It's always easier to judge you than it is to judge me. Because you're more worthy of that judgment than I. 
That's what it says. Oh, how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Now, you know what he just said? Would you go to a doctor that would ha do surgery on your eye when he's blind in both his eyes? That's what it says. It says, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shall thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast uh, ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn again and rent you. You may be seated. As our Lord addresses this idea of judgment, He's not going to pull any punches. He's going to speak very abruptly and very boldly. Amen. He's not looking to spare their feelings. He's looking to correct their judgmental attitudes. Amen. There is a time that truth being told in love uh, uh, has to be the foref in the forefront of our conversation, no matter who it is. Have you ever found yourself talking to a family member or something, and you're talking about the Lord and the gospel, and they just keep coming with, the, with false ideas, they have their own opinions and all that, and you just finally have to say, stop. I have to tell you that what you're saying is not true according to Scripture. I love you, but what you're doing is a lie. And that's exactly what Jesus is fixing to do to these people. These that are here, amen. And so he begins uh, uh, with a very straightforward attitude, giving great warning to the family of believers. He's writing to the Christians, to those who believe about their bad attitudes. Amen. amen. He will use our text to show forth or to put forth that warning that says, be careful how you judge others because in judging them, you're setting a standard for your own judgment. I told my wife on the way to church tonight, she said, what are we talking about tonight? And I says, Matthew 7. She said, oh, about judgment? I said, yeah, this is a terrible subject for me. And, and I reminded her of this because she knows who I am more than anybody else. I preach the Bible as truth, whether I am completely yielded to it or not. It's still truth. Amen. It's truth to you and to me. It corrects you and me. Amen. And as I was preparing this lesson, I had to stop and have a season of prayer and remind uh, myself uh, of my often too much of a judgmental attitude. I mean, going down the highway, I get in the judgment seat. <laughs> Look at that person. They can't drive. They probably made a higher score on their driving test than I did. Amen. But are we kind of lean toward judgment in just about everything we do every day? We perceive people and we measure them. Oh, listen, we don't measure them by what we are. We measure them by what we declare to be. Declare ourselves to be. Amen. I think there's not a person in the world that drives better than I do. Especially a lady. Therefore, anyone that's in my way, I judge as poor driver. They're out there, I think, at 8 o'clock in the morning, actually at 7 6.30, whenever I start toward town. I actually have found myself, and my wife agreed with this, coming from my house. I live out 13 and a half, 14 miles from here. 13 years ago, when I moved out there, I could drive from my house to this church and never see a vehicle at 6 o'clock in the morning. And now I can't get down the road. All these people. And I get behind what I'm saying. If you were going to drive like this, why didn't you move somewhere else? Am I the only one guilty of that? Do you know that's a you're judging? Just saying. So I know this lesson's for me as well, okay? So it's a warning that judgment is detrimental to our spiritual well-being. It's detrimental to our walking in fellowship with Jesus. Amen. It's detrimental to God's blessings and may well turn us to God's discipline. So let's just begin tonight in verses 1. And the Bible says, judge not. Boy, those are stout words. Do not judge. That's what it means. Simply says, don't do it. Do not judge. Amen. By these two words, a commandment is given. A commandment is given. Do not. Amen. This is not optional. He didn't say, don't judge others unless you think you're right because that would give me a clear road to judge. 
Amen? Because it seems as though we always think we're right. Wives, have you noticed your husband's never wrong? Amen. And I have noticed that my wife isn't, or at least she doesn't think so, but I've discerned that she is more often than not wrong. Judgment. I'm telling you, it is. It happens in the home. It happens in, uh, between parents and children. It happens in the church. It happens on the highway. It happens in the workplace. Judgment seems to be the failure of most human beings. But when we become a child of God, when we become that upright person, according to what we're studying on, uh, on uh, uh, Sunday nights, uh, as we travel that King's Highway, it is a failure that we all have to deal with because it is so common. It's so common that we often do not even consider it. Amen? And so this Bible, so the Bible says, judge not. This, me, this word judge here has a particular meaning. It says uh, uh, not to judge. Judgment means to criticize, to condemn, or to pronounce failure on somebody else. Because when we do that, number one, well, we, I want to give you that. I started to say you don't know all the facts, but that's point two. We'll get to that. Amen. So that this idea of judgment is that by my moral, cal, uh, uh, my moral compass, I pronounce that this action is wrong by my moral compass. Do you know the Bible says even your conscience will lie to you? Your moral compass is totally corrupt. Have you ever tried to travel with a compass? Any any, how many of y'all know how to use a compass? Anybody in the military knows how to use a compass? Yeah, a few of us. Yeah, I know how to use a compass. And it's dependent upon north always pointing the same place. Magnetic north. Amen? So that you always have a center. Do you know that our moral compass, you and I as men, even save men and women, our moral compass is subject to my moral condition. A man who is carnal, a believer who's walking in carnality, de demonstrating himself as, uh, as, a, as a lost person, walking in the more closely to the world's count, uh, idea of, of living than to God's idea of living, his moral compass is 180 degrees out. Yeah, Amen? Amen? And every one of us, to one degree or another, we are not perfect in this world, so do not depend on your moral compass. You must depend upon the compass of true north, which is the Word of God. Amen? Amen? There is uh, this idea that we are able, willing, and should be allowed to determine right and wrong for you but don't you do it for me. Amen. Amen. This word judgment, which means to discern or to uh, uh, pronounce, is in some ways part of what we as Christians are required to do. That is that we are to make moral discernments. There is a difference. We're going to talk about it. A moral discernment uh, 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 is to discern right and wrong and then to separate ourselves from it. But not the one who's failing. Doesn't the Bible say if you see a brother taken in a fault, you're supposed to go to him and restore him, not kill him? Amen. We have to make moral discernments, amen, uh, uh, at times. You remember in 2 Thessalonians where we were uh, uh, studying uh, a couple of weeks ago on uh, uh, what was it? Sunday nights. Uh, we, were, we studied through 2 Thessalonians and we found that if you see a brother that's walking disorderly, you're supposed to mark him, separate yourself from him. It's not that you judge him unworthy. Don't you not judging him as a failure. You're protecting the holiness of the body of Christ. Sunday night we serve the Lord's Supper. You remember what we talked about? How that we are a body of, of members and what one member does, uh, uh, it affects all of the body. And if we allow corruption to walk in the body of Christ without discernment, and the Bible says if they walk disorderly, they don't walk according to the rule that we've established for a church, we're to separate from them, not to make them, uh, 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 not to judge them as unholy, but to preserve the integrity of the holiness of the body of Christ. Amen. But to that one who has been separated from, then he becomes the object of our 
prayers and concern and of our desire to reconcile him back into the fellowship of the body of Christ, not judging him unworthy, but judging him uh, uh, only as not fit at this time, but being brought back into the body. Amen. So there are discernments. But when you say you're a judge or you judge, it means that you put yourself in the seat of God, that you discern his right according to your standard that you discern his failure and pronounce guiltiness upon him. And then you discern his sentencing. Amen? Only God has the right to do that. Amen. In fact, God says that we're not to judge another man's servant. And the believer is God's servant, not yours. And the only one he answers to for judgment is God. Amen? So he says we are not uh, to judge, that we are to, uh, to allow God to do the judging. Amen. We're uh, 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 required to walk uprightly before God and to encourage other believers to do the same. Amen. And if one fails, you know, you can fail in walking with God. I don't want to say accidentally, but without knowledge. When you got saved, did you know that the, the day you got saved We'll say this is the day you got saved. And you were over here in your sins, in, on your way to hell. And the grace of God came into your heart by the Word and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And right here, you asked God to forgive you. And according to John chapter 1, you became a child of God. And you were now here. Now you're on the outside of the cross. You're inside the cross. What changed in your personal character? You were born again. Old things passed away and all things become new, but the activity of your life came right by that cross with you. Amen? And so I promise you, I promise you, the first day of your salvation, with all desire that you had to not sin against God, to make God pleased in you as a child of God, but with limited knowledge of the Word, if you was like me, I had about this much knowledge of the Word of God, I guarantee you the first day that I walked in the grace of God, saved and born again, excited about I was going to heaven, I did so many things that was contrary to the Word of God. Thank God, he said, where there's no law, there's no imputing of sin. Amen. Amen. We have to grow, don't we? Yes. Amen. So uh, uh, we can do wrong even without knowledge. But when that knowledge is revealed, then we must come in line with what the truth of the Word of God is. Just because you've done something over and uh, since you've been saved, over and over and over, and then you read in the Bible, that's a sin. You don't get to keep doing it. You've got to forsake it right then. Amen. So we can do wrong without even knowing it. But the, what he's dealing with here is doing wrong with knowledge. To judge others is doing wrong and you know it. Somebody says, well, how do I know it? How do I know it? Well, let me show you. Because when you judge somebody else and you see that sin in your life, you're just as guilty as he was. But isn't it hard to say, I'm guilty? It's not so hard to say, you're guilty. Remember, this self-sufficiency doesn't allow for any input of knowledge or correction except my own. Mm -hmm. We are... protecting the church when we discern wrong and right. And we actively are involved with preserving the holiness of the church. But excommunicating from the church is the last, is the last step. Matthew says, first you've got to approach them. Then you've got to bring a witness. Then it's got to go to the church. You've got to do all that you can to fix the problem. Amen. So we're not judging when we discern. I heard somebody say, well, we're fruit inspectors. Who told you you was a fruit inspector? A man beareth fruit before his own master, not before you. 
I, I told somebody at the, at the restaurant the other day, we were talking about this, and I don't remember what the, all, the whole subject was, but I said something to the effect, because I knew this lesson was coming up, I don't want to judge you. Because when I judge you, I say, you have a right to judge me. Me no likey that. I don't want you looking into my life enough to discern my right and wrong. I want you to examine me according to my holiness in the body of Christ for the preservation of a holy body. But if you see fault in me, scripturally speaking, because I don't measure up to whatever it is that you think is right, scripturally speaking, you see fault in me, I pray you'll come and tell me that fault. Don't come with a counsel of the church to excommunicate me. Come first to pray with me. Amen. Come first to bring me to discernment of wrong, yes. if I be wrong. But be sure you got your ducks in a row when you come. Amen. When we judge others, the Bible says you got to first consider your own eye. Amen. If you read that, and we'll go through this a little bit more thoroughly, it says uh, in verses 3, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? Now, do you know the difference between a mote and a beam? Let me show you. A mote is a splinter, a small... Have you ever had a little, a little sticker in your finger? And how it hurts? And every time you touch it, it's there? That's a moat. You know what a beam is? That's a beam. How can you even see the moat in your brother's eye with the beam in your eye? And that's exactly what he's saying. You cannot see clearly the failure of another when you can't even judge your own failures. Where do we get off thinking that I have a right uh, to judge you when I can't even judge me? That's good. Amen. When a brother has failed... It's time to be a spiritual man. Remember what spirituality it was? To have compassion. To pray. Amen. To fast over the failure of a brother that God, by the Spirit, might convict him and discern his wrong in his heart Amen. and bring him back. The first step, ladies and gentlemen, of reconciling a brother who has been taken in a fault is to pray. Amen. We are not to judge, but the spiritual brother is to walk in love. Galatians chapter 6, remember, if you see a brother taking a fault, listen to what it says here. Those of you who are, thank you, spiritual, go to him. God didn't say those that think you're worthy to judge go to him and tell him how wrong he is, tell him what he's doing that's terrible. He says, those of you who are spiritual, what does it mean to be spiritual? We just talked about it in Matthew 6. He said, if you're a spiritual man walking in fellowship with me, walking in the spirit and not in the flesh, you'll pray, you'll fast, uh, uh, you'll, uh, uh, you'll have compassion, you'll do these things that God did. What Jesus did in this world, he's very compassionate, very loving. He went to those that were uh, filled with demons and cast out the demons and restored them. He healed uh, uh, they, those that were lame and, uh, and those that had leprosy. In fact, he healed one leopard and said to him, now go and sin no more. That's right. He didn't judge him. He healed him. Amen. Isn't judgment so easy, though? When a brother has failed, it's time for the compassion of Christ. It's time for reconciliation. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ came alongside us. Christ looked upon us and loved us. Uh, uh, amen. When even while we were yet sinners. Amen. Uh, uh, he commended his love toward us. Amen. And died for us on the cross. That's what he's talking about. Do you know they in the church that are upright don't need your help? Usually those are the ones probably do need your help because they're Self-righteous, but nevertheless. <laughs> we are a body of Christ, saved by the grace of God, and we are but sinners. In every pew, we are but sinners. None of us have reached perfection until we get to heaven. Amen. 
Amen. And what we need is not the other brethren to judge us, but to come alongside us with love and compassion and caring. Amen. He says, judge not. Amen. When a brother has failed, the spiritual are to come to him. Now, let me tell you what will happen. When the, I like that. They of you that are spiritual, when you see a brother taken out of fault, those of you who are spiritual, go to him. I got two questions for you. Number one, how do you know he's taken in a fault? Well, you're going to have a hard time going to him if you don't know how to know if he's taken in a fault. Huh? Yeah, you have to witness. It's not hearsay. It's a personal witness according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now hang on. And the moving of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. on you. Mm -hmm. Not him, you. Those of you who are spiritual, good. go to him. You don't say, well, I'm telling you, Frank, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. I came to help you. <laughs> You bathe that in prayer. Amen. And you gain the compassion of Christ in your heart and you follow His leadership in the Spirit right. and go to Him and let God speak through you. Amen. And the first thing you better do is establish with that person that you're here after much prayer and fasting that you're here with a broken heart. Tell him about why you're there first, not to judge him, but to help him. Amen. And expect him to punch you in the eye. Amen? Maybe not physically, but he's not going to take kindly to you. But if he sees the heart of Christ in you, he'll be more moved to hear you. Whether he responds yet or not, he'll be moved to hear you. That's good. You ever heard somebody that's say maybe to you or something of that nature because of something you're trying to help them with. They said, and usually I, when I was a, a kid uh, in a family of five boys, we did this all the time because we always, all, every one of us always wanted to be in charge. Mom and daddy didn't get home late until in the evening, usually about 6 to 6.30 every night. We got off the bus around 4. We have two and a half hours at home before mom and daddy get there. There's five of us. Somebody had to be in charge. And usually I thought it should be me. And Clifford thought it should be him. And Leroy thought he had more compassion and understanding than Clifford or I either one, so he surely should run it. The other two didn't matter. They was too young. And I've heard Clifford say to me more than once, and I've said to Leroy, and Leroy, it's a common, who died and made you judge? Who died and put you in charge? When you go to that brother, you can expect that. Because he's taken in a fault. Sin has conquered in his life for whatever the reason. Illustration. Remember a fellow named David who sinned with Bathsheba? He was taken in a fault. And God tapped a prophet on the arm. I believe his name was Nathan, wasn't it? I get that Nathaniel confused now because of Stephen's kids. But uh, he tapped that prophet on the arm and he says, Prophet, you're a spiritual man. Go talk to David. And that prophet said, you kidding me? <laughs> Who goes and reprimands the king? And Nathaniel came to David and said, got a message from you or for you from God. Amen. And because of the heart of the prophet, David listened. And David repented of his sin and was restored as king of Israel. Now, never was he the king that he once was. But he was reconciled to God because a prophet, someone sent by God, came alongside with love and compassion and told him his sin. 
That's not an easy job. If God elects you and puts you in that position, you know you go with God and you better go in God's compassion. Amen. Amen. When a brother's failed, it's time to become spiritual and to walk with God according to that brother's fault. It says in Corinthians, or I'm sorry, Galatians 6, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, if he's done wrong, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Listen to the last part. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know, we're all the same persons. We're cut out of the same cloth. We're made out of the same dirt. We have the same weaknesses, and we got to be careful thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought. Because when we see a brother taking a fall, our first statement should be, except for the grace of God, that's me. Yeah. Amen. I have a, a statement I've made oftentimes. It's so real, and it's so true. Amen? A believer, a born-again man, someone's name in the Lamb's Book of Life, has his sins forgiven, and he's eternally kept by the promise of God, can do anything a lost man can do but go to hell. Right. You can, and I can. I had a preacher friend once. Well, I still have him. He's not dead. <laughs> he was a very good preacher, a very good man. He had great compassion. He pastored the church I attended when I was in Bible college. And if any of y'all know about Bible college, and you know it's hard. It's not just hard in studies, but it's hard financially if you're there with a family. And this man had, I don't recall now, but I'm going to just say, don't hold me to this number, it was somewhere between 8 and 10 Bible student couples in his church. Students that had children, working jobs and going to school, paying tuition, financially very, very hard. You don't know it's hard because there's so much of God's grace being poured out on you. But he'd come over, he's done it at my house more than once, and he'd get my car or Miss Melba's car the first time he did it, he came over and asked Miss Mel if, she, if he could borrow her car. Well, who, who don't loan the preacher your car? So he, she loaned him the car, and he came back and gave her the keys and said, thank you so much, and just left. And she goes outside to get her car because she had to go get, I think it was Kenneth from nursery school or wherever it was. And the car, back seat of the car was full of groceries. And the gas tank was full of gas. That's the kind of guy he was. I went to church there three and a half years, I think, and dealt with this very compassionate, caring man every day. Right after I had left Bible college and went to Miami to start the church there, I got a call from one of the students that was still there going to church. He said, our church burnt. I said, what do you mean the church burnt? He said, it just caught on fire and it burned. So my heart is broken for the church and for the preacher. And since I wasn't far from Springfield, because we're just down for, out of Joplin there a little ways, I jumped in the car and went to check on our pastor. And I got there and I prayed with him and all that kind of thing and everything rocked along and the next thing I heard was they were filing arson charges on the pastor. He had gotten himself in trouble with some of the finances in the, in the church and had set the church on fire himself in the office area to burn the records. Not being wise enough to know that a bank keeps records. What we have in this office is a copy of what First State Bank has, or what is that we deal with? What is it? Financial. First Financial Bank. They've got a copy of everything we do. We just got, and by the way, some of our copies are not complete because we forget to file them or they get, but he burnt 
that office. Needless to say, he wasn't the pastor there anymore. And there was a lot of very rude and crude things that were being said about him. He did wrong, there's no doubt. He left the church, went back to his home church where he came out of. Stayed there for about three or four years under the direction of his pastor. And went to a small church up in the very northern part of Oklahoma. And went in and candidated for a church. He said, are you crazy? Why would you even consider him? He went in and talked to the pulpit committee and then talked to the church itself and told them everything he had done. And he told them, I will not touch the money. I will not be in charge of any of it. I will preach and counsel and I will uh, deal with the people, but I won't have anything to do with the finances. And somebody in that church had enough good sense to know that one mistake does not destroy a total life. And they took him on as their pastor. It was a small church. I left from up in that area and went to New Mexico. Kind of lost touch with them. The last thing I heard, he was still at that church. And the church had succeeded, had been successful. You see, it's easy to find judges. It's not so easy to find spiritual people. And as best I can tell, you can tell me if I'm wrong, there is not one thing in the Bible, not one sin in the Bible that God says, if you do this, you cannot serve me anymore. From the day you get saved, you're supposed to serve God every day of your life. Now, I do understand sometimes the failures in our life limits how we can be used of God because there may not be any reconciliation because the Word of God allows for no reconciliation for that particular sin. You go out and murder somebody, and I know a person this happened to. You go out and murder somebody, and you go to the prison, uh, then you do the best you can to serve God in jail. Amen? So then who are we to shut the church door to a man or a woman has failed? If they be reconciled to God by repentance and returning, then we're to receive them back. Amen. Judge not. Amen? When they fail, they are now a vessel in need of compassion, not judgment. In fact, the Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ, you remember Jesus said, a new law I give unto you that you love one another. Okay. That's the law of Christ, by the way. This is not a new commandment, but is an old commandment reemphasized. You see, the Old Testament, we're supposed to love one another because the law said to. Yep. Jesus said, you love one another because I loved you. Amen. Amen. He goes further and says, you know you've passed from death into life. Do you know how you know personally that you're saved? Not what God knows, how you know. You know you've passed from death into life because you love the brethren. Right. We don't need judges. We have a judge. We need people that will stand in compassion and holiness and discernment and love one for the other. Good. That's point one. <laughs> Next week I want to pick up in verse one. <laughs> Judge not that ye be not judged. If you want mercy and forgiveness, you got to give mercy and forgiveness. Amen. You can, honest, I'm telling you the truth, you can limit what God will do for you when you need forgiveness based on how you treat somebody who needs forgiveness. Amen. Wow. And then I see myself 
driving down the road and somebody in front of me and I'm saying, forgive me ladies, I'm, I'm, the Bible says confess your faults. I bet that's a woman driver. And you go around him and it's a man. <laughs> and you think, doesn't a man know how to drive better than that? Apparently not. <laughs> and you're already becoming his judge. You'd like to take him and give him some driving lessons and teach him how to drive. But who made you a driving instructor? I've had tickets for not driving properly. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And I thought about this when I was preparing this lesson. Not long ago, it's, well, it's been a year or two now, I think. It's been a while. I got stopped by a policeman, a woman policeman, <laughs> on a motorcycle, going, for, going through, what's the little town just this side of Lake Worth? Lake City. You didn't know that it was even there, did you? I didn't either. But before you drop down that hill and get to the, go over the bridge, so that, back up, that's, that's Lake City. They have a motorcycle cop, a lady. And I thought I would be cool. She stopped and I said, man, I like that bike you're riding. I ride. I'm making points, I think. She says, I hate these things. <laughs> That's what she said. And I said, well, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to be speeding. She said, you were, I think it's 65 there or 60. She said, I was doing 15 mile over. I was thinking. I was going for a hospital visit. I wasn't paying attention. Didn't know there was a town there. I thought, I'm just going to put on my sweet attitude. She wrote me a ticket. Cost me $300. And I said, why didn't she have a little compassion on my driving, just a little out of bounds? And the Lord said, how much compassion did you have on that old fellow you pulled up behind and you were saying, hey, old man, get out of the way. <laughs> what you sow, you reap. And sometimes we think, well, I'll tell you what, what's a woman doing out here writing me a ticket? What's a cop? Why can't I get a break? Why can't I get some? My wife gets stopped. They just write her a warning and let her go. Not me. You know why? Because I drive in a judgmental way. If you want to get compassion, you got to give it. Yeah, I know. You better hide your face. Or you will set the standard by which that policeman deals with you. We'll start on that next week. Stand with me if you would. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for your love and we thank you, Lord, how often you teach us the things that we ought to know right out of our own life. So, Lord, I pray that you will bless as we study these verses on judgment. God, we're guilty of it. We're so guilty. It's probably the one thing that all of us consistently are the most guilty of is judging others. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to walk spiritually. The world doesn't need any more judges. They've got plenty. And heaven doesn't need any more judges. You are the judge, Lord. What we need is believers that are compassionate, long-suffering, and willing to do whatever is necessary to hold on or to restore one taken in a fault. Bless Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. What page, brother?